the voice. 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 Okay, and I will wait for it to be on Facebook to you. And then we can launch. The new Zoom chat is weird. Yeah, I haven't gotten to new Zoom yet, but we are not yet on Facebook. I think. It, it feels very texty, like you're on your phone texting. It's weird. Zoom does. That's not, it always seems like improve, improvements. Okay, now we are on Facebook. Improvements to such things are always worse somehow. It's like, we have to do something. Let's do something. And it's done. And then it's technically like for the user experience, always worse. Okay, we are now live and recording and everything else. So uh, welcome everybody to History Matters. And really at the end of the semester, coffee really matters. <laughs> really big mug today. Um, welcome as always. Um, we are uh, going to be talking as advertised uh, on Twitter um, about rights in a broad sense. And you'll see what I mean by that when I come back to that in a moment. Um, however, and I see people are stumped by the background, that's good. Uh, however, uh, before I launch into what I want to talk about, I want to turn to my partner in crime, Matt. I am so glad to see you, Matt. And he will now explain the rules of the game. The rules of the game are as follows as always. If you, uh, we encourage you to use chat. We love seeing all the chat. And as Carolee said, chat is where it's at. So please join us and- Did you say that this morning? What's that? Did she say that this morning? Chat something along those lines. I, I, I went ahead and I think I made it poetic, but she actually did say something along those lines. Okay. Christy is joining us for the first time. Oh, um, that's right. She's up there in the corner. See, I never not the know first who... time, but it's first time in a long time in in Zoom. So. And I never know who's here who, or who isn't because people aren't always visible to me. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what was I saying? Oh, yes. So please use chat and uh, as always, keep it germane to the conversation and of course, family friendly. Um, if you do have questions, make sure you put them in the Q&A because that's where we like to take questions. It's a lot easier to keep track of everything in the Q&A. So please do that. And so that is it for me. Okay, uh, so here we are talking about rights. Um, it's going to be rather obvious when we're talking about rights. Uh, Obviously, there's been a much discussion uh, of rights this last week and of a fundamental right about abortion rights. Um, and along those lines, I wanted to talk about um, the concept of rights. And as I put it on um, Twitter, the idea of rights. So I'm not as interested in speaking about specific rights. I am very interested in specific rights, but, but what I wanted to talk about this morning was the importance of the idea of rights and why that in and of itself matters and how above and beyond the actual ground level granular reality of the, whatever is going on right now having to do with abortion rights and Roe v. Wade, which um, is vital and deserves much more than our one hour conversation here, but that the idea of rights associated with that debate matters as well in and of itself. So, and, and I wanna start with um, an anecdote and I'm gonna hedge in the anecdote by saying, um, I, it, it's gonna involve something that I did um, for my, one of my lecture courses early at, at my time um, at Yale. And it was my American Revolution lecture course and uh, they did their midterm exam and somehow, when I was reading the midterm exam, it became clear to me that the students had somehow come to the conclusion, and obviously it had to be partly based on my lectures, that the American Revolution happened because people didn't like to pay taxes. And this was upsetting to me, um, in part because I, being someone who teaches at Yale, I assume there could be a future um, governor, senator, representative, or president sitting in that lecture room. And I didn't want them to go out into the world and think, oh, people don't like taxes and thus we had a revolution. I wanted them to understand rights and the importance of rights and what rights meant and what the idea of rights meant. So I veered off of my normal syllabus and um, I thought a lot about doing this this morning because, um, and you'll hear why, um, it, it, it 
it is not, I am not going to be actually promoting my politics in any way and in my classrooms uh, when I teach. I also do not promote my politics because I want that space to be a neutral space where everybody is free and easy to think what they think and to really engage with each other and respect each other's ideas. In this one case, I did reveal a little something about my politics. And I, I know it's by this point, we've been doing this. This is our 87th episode. You know pretty much <laughs> in general what my politics are. Um, but I told the class what I'm going to tell you here. And Newbie's very excited about this. Um, I told the class what I'm going to tell you here, which is the story that I'm going to tell you is not meant to promote uh, the the organization or the actions that I'm doing, the reason, and you'll hear, the reason I'm telling this story is because of the overall motivation of my fighting for a right that ultimately I wasn't necessarily going to use, but the idea of the right mattered to me. So I, I begin this story by saying, you know, I'm not promoting anything except thinking about the idea of rights. So the story that I told my class was, um, it happened many, many years ago. Um, now it doesn't feel so long ago, but um, it was when there was all of the um, operation rescue um, attacks on abortion clinics and they were happening all over the place. And um, I read about that in the newspaper and I saw what was happening and I was upset by it. So I began to kind of look around to see like what were other people thinking about this or doing about this and discovered that um, NARAL and Planned Parenthood were um, organizing people to get together and talk about it and to essentially learn how to defend Nubia's very strong views about rights, to defend um, views, to defend um, abortion clinics, views. Newbie, you're throwing me off here. Um, NARAL and Planned Parenthood had come together. They were having training sessions for people if they wanted to learn how to defend clinics. Now, it was like people getting together in a room. I didn't actually necessarily assume I was going to take action. It was more like there's this right being debated, and it's upsetting to me because it's it's a right, and it's a right I sort of assumed was a right, and now it isn't being assumed as a right, and people are attacking it in a way that felt to me, you know, mostly violent and not fair. So I got together with others to talk about it. We began learning like what passive resistance means and, and how to do it. We learned all kinds of ways to sort of join together to protect doorways and everything else. But again, to me, it just felt like, you know, kind of drilling with like-minded people. Then it moved from that to newbie. You're a boy bird. He's a feminist bird, clearly. Um, at any rate, uh, it moved from our training sessions to actually on Saturday mornings, we would be deployed in groups to different clinics. Uh, at this point, I was in the Washington, D.C. area, Northern Virginia. Uh, and we would be in groups of, I don't know, 10 or 12. And we would mostly huddle in the lobbies, because it was cold, uh, of these buildings just in case something happened. And I did that a lot with many layers of clothing on and nothing happened. And we sat there and we talked to each other and got to know each other and nothing happened. And then one day the phone rang in the lobby of the building and someone picked it up and a voice on the other end said, they're coming to you guys, they're coming. So it suddenly became clear that busloads of people who were really angry about abortion were about to come to the place where we were and were about to attack. Now, at this point, you know, I, I was thinking about the fact that suddenly I was going to be in the middle of what ultimately did become something very big. But here's what I was telling my students. So I, at this point, it's not like I, I was assuming that I necessarily was going to use or need an abortion at that point in my life. I wasn't. Uh, it's not that I was like, you know, well, in a year and a half, I'm going to need this, right? So, it, I mean, to me, it, it felt like an abstract right. But it also felt to me at that time like something that, that I conceived of as a pretty fundamental right about my control of my body was being attacked in a way that alarmed me, even though the specific right was not directly applicable to my life at that moment. And that idea of that right and what it symbolized, what it meant to me that it was being attacked in this way and at that time by busloads of angry people, 
that idea of a right being violated, a right that I believed in, upset me enough that I joined with others, I learned more about it, and then ultimately, all of a sudden, there I am, like, drilling and then joining together with people to defend it. When I was talking to my class about this, trying to get them to understand rights can be a, con a concept that matter, even if the specific right isn't what's at, at stake for you at that particular moment, I realized, and this is what I stopped in the middle of what I was saying to my class, and I said, I was a pro-choice Minuteman. <laughs> Because that's exactly what I did, right? I, I like, I got alarmed. I joined with others. We like drilled around. Like here's how you do passive resistance, you know. We and then we would get together and like stand around like little militia units, you know. Like here we are, we're defending rights. And then all of a sudden, we were actually were. So in a, in a way, with in a way that I hadn't anticipated, my story also played very nicely into that moment in the course where it showed how you can get swept up into something, and and action you know, actual action happens from something that's just an idea. It kind of gave you the class, I think, a sense of what happens if you're just a colonist sort of hanging out, being a colonist, and then suddenly you start to feel that some rights are being violated and it makes you uneasy. And then suddenly, you know, there you are on Lexington Green or in, in Concord, things are happening and you didn't anticipate them happening. It was a, a really, I thought, and the class suggested powerful way of getting at why the idea of rights matter so fundamentally above and beyond, not instead of, but above and beyond the specific right that's being discussed at any given moment. And I will say that um, at the end of the semester, I think one student was upset about what I had done. I can't even tell you how long I spent hedging in when I did so that it was very clear that I was not giving a pro-choice lecture, which was not my intent. I'm very, as I said, very, assertive about not asserting my politics in my classrooms. Most of the class absolutely got what I was saying. What I was talking about was the power and importance of the idea of rights. That's what I've been, well, I've been thinking about many things this week. That's one of the things that I've been thinking about um, this week is not just abortion rights, pro-choice, um, which in and of itself is pretty important for a whole bunch of reasons, but the many reasons why the idea of that right and the idea of rights generally are also being debated right now. And that's particularly true when we're also talking about, or at least witnessing a lot of discussion of voting rights, right? another right. And that one even more universal and um, you know applicable to everyone and pretty fundamental to the survival of democracy. Again, rights that I think people assume they have, haven't thought about necessarily the need to defend them, or at least some people haven't thought about the need to defend them. And suddenly we're talking about voting rights, which can feel like, to some people, I'm sure, an abstract, like, oh, they're talking about voting rights, blah, 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 democracy. But number one, rights conversations have very real, very broad implications. And number two, that's not an abstract conversation in that case. But regardless, the idea of rights matters profoundly. And if you go back, to the founding period, you can see the, the, the whole idea of rights and the power that that has, sometimes in ways that the people asserting those rights never, didn't necessarily intend. So, you know, in the most obvious way, um, if you go to the Declaration of Independence and, you know, see what that it refers to the laws of nature and nature's God and um, people having these kinds of fundamental rights, unalienable rights of mankind, right? That that is very sweeping and very broad language that was not necessarily intended to be as sweeping and as broad as it could have been taken at the time. But that's an example of what I'm talking about here. Because although at that point, you know, it's, pr it's pretty much well off white men who are uh, encompassed in actual sort of, you know, concrete, um, participatory political citizenship, right? So women, poor white men, anyone who's not white, all of these people are not included necessarily in um, this, this, the big we that we're talking about there. But that said, the idea of unalienable rights, the idea that there were natural rights that people were owed, that people had and had a right to, that idea, although it wasn't being adhered to and applied in a way that was just or fair by any stretch of the term, 
was vital because once that idea is out there, once that possibility is out there, it was out there and it, 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 the idea of that right existed and could be grabbed at and owned and used and claimed, particularly by people who felt that they did not have those kinds of rights. So as much as we can look at the founding era, and it's very easy to point to all of the ways in which there was language on one level and reality on another level, and the reality was a pretty hard reality. I have no idea what's getting newbie so upset, but newbie, your bird rights. I am, I am totally following along with your bird rights here. You have the right to chirp. Um, but at any rate, the idea, putting out the idea, the language of rights in that manner, that was a powerful act, perhaps more powerful than the people who were, were putting it out into the world necessarily anticipated. They wanted it to have power. They were trying to justify and defend and inspire a revolution, right? That, that requires some major engagement, some major commitment, some major involvement. But by throwing the language of rights out there in that way, that became a tool that was out in the world for people to use who felt that they did not have, and who in fact did not have the rights to which they were entitled. So part of my point here is that the very idea of rights, of rights that you have and of rights being violated, even above and beyond the specific right that's being debated at a given moment, the idea of rights matters profoundly because it is the acknowledgement that you, have the right to certain things, that you have the right to make that kind of demand, that you have the right to, as a citizen of the United States, to, to make that kind of demand, to voice your needs, to question the government, to all of the things that we sort of take for granted in democracy. But once you have the language of rights, the idea of rights out in the world, that's really powerful in ways that you know the, the founders didn't necessarily intend. That's the larger point that I wanted to get at today is that for black Americans, for women, for all kinds of people who were pretty much not included in some of those fundamental rights being debated, even discussion of natural rights, you know, if you pushed people on that, there would be a lot of hard corners. There were all kinds of people who could and did understand the implications of that language of rights and own it and use it. And that was the case, not just in early America, that became a, an ongoing tool, a way to confront the lack of rights, a way to confront people who were denying rights, a way to say, you, you said this, the country stands for this, your words. So here I am claiming it, right? I'm not appearing out of the blue and saying something, I'm saying the language of rights, the idea of rights, the sort of underlying logic and reality of citizenship. Here it is, and this is bound up in it, and I'm gonna own it and use it. That's really powerful. And I think, you know, we've talked a number of times here on History Matters about um, how the heck do we think about the founding given, you know, the flaws and the constitution and the all of the ways in which the founders and what they did all of the ways in which that was flawed. And more than once I've, I've said that, that what they unleashed had value even if they never lived up to it. That what they unleashed came to be useful for people who were not deliberately not included in that language, in those rights, that that matters. Uh, and this is in a sense is um, another example of that, right? Is, is the fact that the idea of rights all by itself matters, which is why the debate that we're having now matters on so many levels, but on a really basic one, first of all, on a really, in a really basic one, if you're a woman, right, it has a lot to say about your sense of what your rights are just generally in the United States at a given time and how far those rights extend. So that in and of itself has big implications, but above and beyond that, any way in which we at this given moment in time in American history are encouraged to think about rights, to think about what they mean, and more broadly than that, to think about the ways, and this I've definitely talked about before, to think about the ways in which they aren't just for me, myself, and I, but they involve a we, right? We're talking about rights that in the end are 
ways in which government can't impinge upon you, but those rights are there in part for the good of civil society, which is another component that at the moment we're not really strong on here in the United States, but the language of rights, the idea of rights is not just looking in a mirror. It's broader than that. The idea is broader than that. The language is broader than that. By definition, you can't use that language without implying that it gets it, it extends beyond you. So by definition, if you're talking about rights, you're talking about some form of a we. Obviously, a lot of people have very different ideas of who's included in that we, and that's part of where we are right now in American history, and that's part of the moment that we're living through, and that's part of the debate uh, at, that we have to have, and the, um, the protest and the expression of what we stand for needs to be made really strongly. But again, that, that idea, that language, I, I'm, hopefully I'm communicating some sense of all of the implications just of the idea of these kinds of rights, and thus, what it suggests when a right is stripped away, right? Ab again, above and beyond what that right specifically is, and obviously I have strong views about particular rights, including the one that we're talking about this week, above and beyond the significance of that, a right being stripped away has deep significance because it, it sets up a world of possibility, negative possibility. It sets up the ability for things to happen that if it's happening once, it might happen again. It, it sort of normalizes that idea, which is not necessarily a good idea, right? I'm always way too diplomatic in the way I talk about these things. But um, what I'm basically saying is that for in, in ways both positive and negative, the idea of rights um, spreads far beyond the specific right itself and really helps to create an understanding of citizenship an understanding of one's fundamental rights as an American, not just as me, Joanne Freeman, who was living in America at the time, but what it means to be an American, what America itself means. All of this is bound up in, in the idea of rights. And it's important to note, you know, I'm talking as though there's one idea of rights. You know, if you do go back all the way to uh, the, you know, sort of revolutionary slash early national period in American history, then and forever after, there are different ideas about what rights are, right? So even looking at the Constitution, um, some would look at the Constitution and say, you know, the, the Constitution and then, of course, the Bill of Rights, it says, the Bill of Rights specifically says what government can't do, like it limits the government, right? That's what it's about, rights. It, it exerts and, and protects rights of Americans and protects them against what government can do. Others might look at those rights, that Bill of Rights and say, well, no, actually the constitution itself tells you specifically what the government is allowed to do and can't go beyond those bounds. Now, the former view is more a Jeffersonian view, the latter view that, you know, Hamilton and initially Madison too said, you know, we don't really need a Bill of Rights. I mean, I actually have Hamiltonian language here. Um, he, he doesn't, he initially did not approve of the idea of a Bill of Rights. Newby, I know, is always big on democracy, but rights is a, the idea of rights, Newby. He's very swept up in the idea of rights. Um, Hamilton writes in one of the Federalist essays, I think it's 84, um, about a Bill of Rights and why that's not needed. And one of the things he says is, um, I'm going to read his words here. I affirm that bills of rights in the sense and in the extent in which they are contended for are not only unnecessary in the proposed constitution, but would even be dangerous. They would contain various exceptions to powers which are not granted and on this account would afford a colorable pretext to claim more than were granted. For why declare that things shall not be done which there is no power to do? Why, for instance, should it be said that the liberty of the press shall not be restrained when no power is given by which restrictions may be imposed? He then goes on to say that basically he considers the constitution to be kind of a bill of rights. Um, let me find his exact wording here so I'm not um, blah, blah, blah. I'm not paraphrasing Hamilton, but I'm actually giving him his words. Um, blah, blah, I'm not gonna be able to find it in this two seconds of what I'm staring at here, but at any rate, He's saying, right, that, that why, you know, this is his very pro-government, powerful government point of view, which is, well, the Constitution, you know, sort of sets some kind of limits for what the government can do. That's good, you know, but it, it, it's, it's a, an entryway. It's sort of, you know, setting terms for what the government can do, whereas Jefferson is saying, 
we need a bill of rights and many others said as well um there were state constitutions with bills of rights too so it's not as though they're coming you know out of the blue making this kind of assertion but the idea that there should be bills of rights that are explicitly in language attached to constitutions to protect fundamental rights Jefferson and obviously many Americans believe that as well, which is how we get the Bill of Rights. The Constitution is, is ratified provisionally. And the main provision is that there will be a Bill of Rights created and attached to it, which indeed there is. So again, even there, right? Even there, what you have is a Constitution that's passed only because there's the idea that there are fundamental rights that are gonna be stated to be protected. It's, it's the idea that we have rights. The idea that they exist, the idea that we can name them, that we can understand them, that we have a right to demand things that are rights, the idea above and beyond each specific right, but the broader idea that these rights exist, that's part of what differentiates democratic governance from authoritarian governance. In an authoritarian government, we the people aren't a we, really. We the people are individuals who can be acted upon. And we don't have those sorts of rights that exist in a, a sort of broader sense of who we are as Americans and as citizens. So the idea of rights is a fundamental part of democracy. Rights that are being debated and given or taken in a broad sense legally that matters a lot. And, and so that, in a sense, that's the broader message that I want to talk about and communicate today is that the idea of rights, the vocabulary of rights matter too. So that even as we engage in what's going on now and involve ourselves in what we feel to be fundamental rights, in addition to that, we should not lose sight of the fact that stripping of rights or the existence of rights has a very broad implication. And um, as Hamilton, who's not exactly Mr. Democracy, says at one point, it's much easier to surrender rights than it is to get them back. So I lay all of that out there just to remind people about the broader, really sweeping implications of rights that exist in as American citizens, not just as women, and what it means to bridge those rights, the broader implications of that, and what that potentially invites into being. Okay, now I see Carolee, Carolee saying mug, mug, mug. Okay, um, I will show the mug. It's not gonna be a surprise. It was the first thing that came into my mind. And it's really appropriate, um, Carolee, that you're saying this because uh, the mug is, thank you. Thank you for engaging in democracy every Friday morning because we are engaging in our right of free speech to think about democracy, to understand what it is so that we can better protect it. Again, I know that we are like a, a small conversation of people here every Friday morning, but these kinds of conversations matter enormously. And so um, it matters that we do this. I know I thank you every week for this, but this week, this seems particularly to be on target. So this is the mug. Okay. Um, now, and this is Carolee made this one, so that which is why it's appropriate. So I, I always thank Carolee. It also has on the back ridiculous things that I say, but I'm not going to read those. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, um, I'm, I'm it, Mr. Bear and a variety of other things that I've said over the over the years. Um, however, okay, so for anyone else who's new, I, uh, we every week I have a mug that has something to do with our conversation, and every week uh, we have. Matt, who comes up with a background that is related to the theme at hand. And this week he's gotten pretty crafty. I have no idea. I, I cannot even guess. Sometimes I can guess and very often I can't. And someone said thatched roof and that's not giving me any clues. <laughs> so, <laughs> Somebody guessed George Mason or James oh, Madison's house. Oh. Neither of which is correct, but both very good guesses. George Mason is a particularly good guess. Yes, indeed, indeed. But before I before I realize, can can I just say you you said something which I love, which was, um, you're talking about the quotes on the mug, and you said things I've been saying for years, and I love that we've been saying things for years on this show. It is a wonderful thing. Yes, I will I will give you a it better view. Amazing. It is amazing. Okay, so now we can see this. There's a a, a person standing in the door. 
Thomas oh. Paine Cottage. I it's very another good guess. Actually, my I went deeper. Summer house. <laughs> wait, wait, yeah, I went my summer house. Um, no, I actually went deeper. Went further back. This is the uh, birthplace of. Thank you, Clinton. John Locke. I was I was about to say when you said further back, I was like, who else? As a matter of fact, I had notes on John Locke that I just ultimately whizzed right on past. I had John Locke. Oh from, well, you yeah. should you should to get it. Yeah, you should say those. Those are great. Yeah, I, it's true that I, I did start out that way, um, and and got what swept up in what I was doing. And <laughs> my apology. No, well. <laughs> We will get to it, I'm sure. Yeah. But yeah, no, John Locke, who's, uh, uh, of course, the second treatise is is fundamental to uh, to our founding documents. So. Oh, Clinton, I'm looking here. Clinton, Clinton got it. I'm so Clinton impressed. Got yes. it. And in contrast, the Stormtroopers mug for, <laughs> for the authoritarian government. I was going to say, that's the anti-rights mug. Yes, the anti-rights mug. Is that why you picked it? Uh, no, I just like I just happen to like <laughs> okay. that mug. And you, you should have said like, well, of course. You, well, of course I did. <laughs> I, I I think these things through very deeply. No, I actually, actually I just like this mug, and it was this one or the sloth mug, and I couldn't you know take my eye out again every time. No, that's although that was a comical moment in and of itself. I love. <laughs> uh, yes, technically John, John Locke's birthplace. This is correct. So, uh, thank you, Wikimedia Commons, for this picture. I guess oh, okay. to actually attribute it. Who knows? Okay, so we have nine questions, which means that uh, people are do not want me, and they they foreshadowed perhaps that this is one of those topics where I could easily hijack the conversation. So thank you for your questions, and you should weigh in too. I, I will. I will. Don't worry. I will. I have. I have. Uh, like you, I have strong feelings on this particular <laughs> subject. So. Um, yeah. And I do have a couple of really interesting, uh, some questions that popped into my mind that I, I, I will ask a little bit in a little while, but let's start with Dale's question, which is, um, so you are saying that our founding generation felt strongly about the idea of rights, but also the responsibility to discuss and if necessary to defend those ideas. So how has that changed over time? Well, so this is interesting. So when I, when I first um, went on Twitter, as I do, and said, this is what the conversation is about. Um, someone, a, a friend of mine went on and said, well, whoa, like rights, like the whole idea of rights, not even just the specifics, but the whole idea of rights changes fundamentally. Like it's so historically contextualized, right? That how can you do this? And I, I, I didn't, I, this was late last night, so I didn't respond. What I was thinking was, well, because I'm talking about the idea and I didn't even go necessarily into big sweeping comments about individual rights versus group rights or civil rights, which is a big discussion and which as this question suggests, all of those things change dramatically over time at different points. So um, in a way, what I was talking about was intended to sort of leap over those kinds of distinctions because I do think no matter what kind of rights you're talking about, the concept that they exist, <laughs> matters pretty profoundly. So that's kind of where I was headed, but it's a totally valid point to make and an important one to make. So thank you for that question that historically speaking, what we think about as rights, how we understand what a right is above and beyond again, the specifics, but we as individual making rights, demanding rights of our own versus rights that we have to protect us as a citizenry, um, we have a much more individualistic sense of rights now than we necessarily did at the beginning when, you know, you had rights, but those rights were partly for the common good. So it wasn't so much like, I have a right, that that kind of um, tone or, or language of rights uh, becomes a later development. And it's really in the 20th century that the idea of rights kind of has a major transition. Um. Actually, that's a good transition to Gloria's question. And uh, Gloria, forgive me, there's a couple typos in here. So if I'm misstating your question, please uh, yell at me in chat. Um, she, she writes, uh, rights are not in a vacuum. Can the language be misused and be distinctive language? Say, say that again. Uh, that, and I think what she, she's getting at is, this, is kind of what you were just said, that rights are, don't happen in a vacuum. They, they happen in a context. And, right. and so when we talk about rights, is there, um, could, could you dig into the language of rights a little bit more, I think is what she's trying to get at, um, um, which you, you did towards the end there. Right. Um, 
Well, I mean, you know, again, I, I was very deliberately speaking on a broad level because I think when you, one of the issues with rights is that above the, and beyond the broad language of, of having rights that I'm talking about, or <laughs> specifics that you have to tangle with, that are hard to tangle with, that have shadings and, and all kinds of complications to them that make everything that I so nicely just put up here in the stratosphere far more complicated to deal with on a, on a you know, sort of fundamental level, on a ground level reality level. Um, but, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, if you're talking about rights, you're talking about what some people are claiming to be able to do and what other people probably don't want them to do. So you are, in one way, you know, if you're talking about civil rights, they are rights for the we, they're, you know, rights of civil society. But if you're extending rights to people, there will be people who feel that in one way or another, by some other people getting rights, you yourself are somehow being denied rights, right? So that's that becomes a question of, of um, power and um, the balance of power and, and dominance and shifts in the dynamics of society that, that in a way rights touch on by definition, but that th that is part of this sort of broader implications of rights is that they can't help but touch on the way people understand who has power, what kind of power, and how is that adjusted over time? Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I saw um, Gloria, use of rights can be a tool for destruction. I mean, yeah, you know, rights, demanding a right, and I thought about this when I was drawing up my notes, right, because there are all kinds of things you could talk about when you talk about demanding rights. Um, there are all kinds of rights, and there are all kinds of demands, and not every demand for a right uh, is valid or thinking of the common good versus thinking of what you yourself feel you have a right to do. So there are all kinds of shadings here that I could not possibly address in my 30 minute discussion of rights, but it, it's worth thinking about. Um, the idea of rights is a powerful idea and can be deployed for all kinds of purposes. And, and it's another reason why it's, as every week here, it's important to think about the fact that we are talking about, in addition to specifics, an idea that is going to have broader implications and broader repercussions. A lot of what I do here when I come here every week to talk to you is talk about a topic and then say, and so with this thing happening now, it's going to involve us in all of these ways which we might not have thought about before, but which history shows us exist. This is another one of those cases where um, we can all talk about rights in a broad sense right now, we are. And as I said, voting rights, you know, abortion rights, all kinds of rights are, are at stake right now. Um, a lot of other rights, I'm not even gonna go into the list, but um, above and beyond that, um, it's important to, to note that that conversation in and of itself needs to be understood as a conversation with broad repercussions above and beyond the specifics of it. That's the moment that we're in. That's above and beyond the way in which I fundamentally feel that some of these rights, <laughs> like voting and abortion um, are pretty fundamental. The fact that we're debating them right now, the fact that there is a debate, the fact that some people have um, very strong feelings of a kind that may, that express a view about the rights that others might have in society, um, that's very much worth thinking about and observing and including in your personal calculations about what's going on right now and, and what needs to be discussed and voiced um, and acted on. Well, the, that's incredibly helpful, and and folks, just to just to say, there are some sort of specific questions about things going on today, which I will get to, um, but there's a couple more sort of conceptual issues related to rights that I want to tease out. That you guys have some great questions for, and so um, Scott, forgive me, I'm going to tweak yours just a shade. Uh, Scott asks, if a right is quote unquote un unalienable, how can it evolve? How can it change? How can it evolve over time? Well, right, because then you're talking in a sense about natural rights that, that humankind deserves. Um, and obviously, when you go back to the founding, that's part of what they're saying is, that, you know, they're in a debate. Well, it's not a debate, ultimately a war um, against Great Britain. But and part of what they're claiming is that there are these unalienable or inalienable. Any of you who out there who have seen the movie 1776 um, and there's a moment in it when um, there's a, a fight between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson about whether it's inalienable or unalienable. Um, and Adams sort of caves and, and first, first says, 
I have a Harvard education. Like I know this answer to this because I have a Harvard education. When I showed this film to my Yale students, there, there was a lot of guffawing going on. Oh, Harvard education. Um, and then says, I'll fix it with the printer. Um, but either way, whether it's unalienable or inalienable, the idea that there are natural rights is part of what was being asserted by the American revolutionaries. That yeah, there are, you know, there's the Magna Carta, there's all kinds of other sorts of rights that we've been talking about. We're actually reaching beyond that now and talking about natural rights. Um, which is a broader conversation, but again, ties into what I was just talking about in the, the vocabulary of rights and the concept of rights and the reach of rights and the ways in which just having that conversation can fundamentally shift how we understand who we are and as a people, as a nation, because this is bound up with nation states too, as well as our individual place in those societies. Well, Kathleen asks a question. Um, actually, she, she found a quote from um, Justice Ginsburg, um, which I'll read for you in a moment. But she wants she's hoping that you can clarify, expand on whether or not you agree with it uh, is it would be would be helpful. So uh, Justice Ginsburg wrote, neither the, the original Constitution nor the Bill of Rights bestows any rights on individuals to the framers. No document could perform that task in their view individual rights antedated the state and thus were not the states to confer. I, I think, I mean, this is a really broad sweeping topic that I will not do justice to in a handful of minutes, but I will say that the, the idea of individual rights in the sense that we take for granted now is largely a 20th century twist that it's very focused on the individual, that that's what it's about. It's about you, as opposed to the concept of broader rights that are still, we're talking about protecting and conferring rights, but the individual component of it, the emphasis, put it that way, on the individual component of it is something that evolves over time. So yeah, this is partly um, bound up with originalism and you know, sort of going back to the founding era and the founders, the founding generation, the framers, all of those ers, um, and, assuming that, you know, well, they said this, so e it eternally means this. Rights are a great example of how originalism is problematic <laughs> because um, as, as some of the questions already have asked, right, things, meanings evolve over time, implications change over time. Historical context matters profoundly in so many ways, and this is a, a, a major way in which they actually do matter. I see, I, before we go into the next question, I have to say that Tim has actually put up the 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 um, lines from the movie 1776. From 1776, I saw that. Yeah, uh, John Adams says, "Mr. Jefferson, it so happens that the word word is unalienable, not inalienable." Jefferson says, "I'm sorry, Mr. Adams, but inalienable is correct." John Adams, I happen to be a Harvard graduate, Mr. Jefferson. <laughs> That's the point where my students guffaw, and Jefferson says, "Well, I attended William and Mary." And Hancock says, Mr. Jefferson, will you concede to Mr. Adams' request? And Jefferson says, no, sir, I will not, and smiles at Adams. And Adams says, oh, very well, I withdraw it. And Franklin says, oh, good for you, John. <laughs> and then John Adams mutters, I'll speak to the printer about it later. <laughs> <laughs> That's classic. I love that movie. I'm sorry. Uh... Yeah. Well, actually, you, you mentioned something about this idea of an originalist court, which is what Becky gets at. Um, and, and we've talked about it before, but could you briefly refresh everybody's mind um, what you see as the problem with an originalist court? Well, I mean, just generally speaking, the idea of originalism being that you go back to the framers and the founders and, and decide precisely what they meant when they wrote what they wrote. Um, not thinking about historical context, but just saying, well, they said this this way, and this is what it means, and that's thus what it means forever. For all kinds of a reason, all kinds of reasons, that's problematic. It, it's it's a moment in time, a place in time, there a, a use of language in time, historical context matters. I'm not saying that everything that's in the Constitution is like poo you know, it doesn't matter. It's all in the moment. It matters as a as a fundamental document. But claiming that you can understand precisely what was in Madison's mind at that moment, for example, and then saying that what was in his mind at that moment extends through all of time, regardless of everything that happens around it, that's a problematic view, in my opinion. Um, it's a, you know, it's a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a comforting view, right? Because it suggests that there's an absolute it that you can point to and say, this is it. This is the it. This is what it means. 
and as we all know, right, um, there is, the Constitution has a lot of its. <laughs> right. There's no one, right? And that's even at the time, right, there was an assumption that the framers assumed and the founders um, that the Constitution needed to be a different kind of document. It needed to be above and beyond a typical legal document. It needed to have authority. It needed to be understood as something that couldn't simply be like tossed aside or you know changed without thinking. There's a formal amendment process for a reason. Constitutions need to be capable of framing and ordering society, and they can only do that if they exist above the sort of average everyday legal system. But that said, the amendment process is there for a reason, right? The framers never assumed that what they were doing, like for all of time, this will, you know, they, they assumed that you could change things. They also, you know, didn't necessarily assume that everything that they did was right. I mean, John Adams has these great letters. Um, I think I've probably referenced this at least once before people would write to him when he was in his old age and say, you know, oh, Mr. Adams, you know, explain to us again, like how you did X and how you did Y. And the underlying question there is always, you were so wonderful. You, you, you founders and framers, like, how did you do the miracles that you did? And Adams' response is always like, yeah, we didn't know what the heck we were doing. <laughs> like, we, we made mistakes all the time. And we, and, and he, in one case, I know I've mentioned this once before, he, he talks about the fact that he sat and watched people sign the Declaration of Independence uh, and how he saw the faces of people signing that document. And a lot of people were very unhappy about doing it. Right. So it's not like there was this sort of golden haze of certainty ever about anything. Um, and not only that, but that idea that there was a golden moment when everyone knew something was right and they all acted on it uniformly, that that does an injustice to the very idea of democratic governance in a, in a broad sense, right? What happened at that founding moment, even though it was a really thinly channeled conversation, right? A lot of people not included in that conversation, but it actually was a debate. There was no one right answer the, the debate part of it was the important part of it. The conflict was the important part of it. The, the, the sort of banging back and forth. That's democracy, right? Contest and competition and debate and compromise. Compromise, right? All of these things that show the many ways in which things aren't really predetermined or shouldn't be, and that it's the competition and the feeding and banging and competing that you end up ideally with something that makes everyone partially happy and everyone somewhat unhappy and that that's a compromise, that's democracy, right? Democracy, they're in a democracy, there's no certainty that certain people, um, for example, one political party um, will always win no matter what. And if you are in a society that's meant to do that, you're working against democracy. Democracy is about contest and competition in one way or another. And sometimes you don't, you really don't like who wins the contest or the competition. And that's true for everybody, right? And that's the, you know, the, the, the risk and the reality, and in some cases, the benefits of, of democracy. Yeah, I think the one thing I'd add, which you touched on there is the solidity of originalism also assumes that they're, the founders are a monolithic thing, which we've talked about quite a bit. Right, but, right, that there isn't yeah. a founder blob, I think is what I call it. Yeah, the there's, founder blob, there, that, there's yes, no absolutely. founder blob, yeah. Yeah. Precisely. I mean, just, right, think about the Constitution. It's not, they all, not everyone agreed, even on the fact that the Finnish Constitution was a good thing, you know? Yeah. Patrick Henry was, you know, there were a lot of people who thought, ah, I don't know about this. Um, even, you know, I've talked about this before too, you know, Hamilton thought, well, okay, this is good for now, but it's going to fail. Mm -hmm. uh, th there's a lot of, there is no founder blob. Just like now, you know, we, we tend to even still think in, in blobs, you know, this is what these people think, and this is what those people think. And that's, um, on the one hand, useful thinking, and on the other hand, it can be lazy thinking, uh, which creates arguments that don't really even exist. This versus this, and that when you actually dig down a little bit, it's not that clean, it's never that clean, it's more subtle, and the subtleties contain possibilities. And when we ignore the subtleties, we kind of rule out the possibilities as well. Well, so so Tom gets at uh, sort of the next step of this conversation, which is, uh, isn't the we, quote unquote, we component of personal rights comparable to the contention between federal rights and states' rights? And that, that's something we haven't touched on yet is how, how do federal rights and states' rights play um, with the concept of rights? 
Right. Well, and that's, you know, it's always really interesting to talk about federalism when you talk about the founding era, because on the one hand, um, it was brilliant as a compromise so that you had people at the time who were very worried about national anything, right? That, that they're coming from their colonies, which in a sense were kind of nation states. And even though they joined together in the revolution, they're still a national something is a very intimidating, frightening thing that feels as though it might stamp out or cancel the states. So the, in the constitution, they don't talk about national things. They talk about federal things. And the idea of federalism was, okay, so, you know, it's a little national. There are some rights that are national and there are some rights that are on a state level. And we're not gonna necessarily really define all of that in this document. We'll just acknowledge that, you know, that there are different spheres of power, that there's in a sense divided sovereignty, that federalism allows for that kind of interplay. Brilliant, because people who were really worried about, you know, all capital letters, national, anything, federalism made that less frightening. On the other hand, that very ambiguity of federalism sets up, you know, centuries of conflict because of this very issue. It, it never, it deliberately doesn't define for many things where they should be decided. It leaves that to be determined as we proceed along as a nation. So, and, you know, that as long as we are a nation that will not stop because um, that our constitution basically says some rights are in one way and some rights are in another way. And for a lot of them, <laughs> have a go at it, figure it out, have some competition, bring it up to the Supreme Court. You know, the system is set up for us to make, have these arguments and it's set up to make situations where this argument has to be had. So it's, it was a deliberate sort of obfuscation device in many ways. Brilliant. It, it combined a um, the state and we the people way of looking at things together. Um, but that, that ambiguity um, is good and can be messy or challenging or cause a heck of a lot of conflict. And, and contingency, right? I haven't said that yet today. Contingency, because you don't know when an issue is being debated at any given moment, who might win in that debate over you know, who has the power and who doesn't, or if it's going to stick in time. Oh, there it goes. Everybody's they, like, they've been, no. they've been waiting for you to say it. It's in fact, there's a comment about four or five minutes ago. Somebody, no, she hasn't said contingency yet. <laughs> okay. If anyone is new here and doesn't understand the bingo component, I should have known contingency 55 minutes in and I got to contingency. <laughs> I love you guys. I truly love you guys. Um, history blob versus contingency. Yeah. Bingo winners. Apparently there are a lot of bingo winners. And but there's a reason why I say contingency every week, which is actually related to what we're talking about here with rights, which is that um, rights themselves are contingent. We're we're watching that right now. Um and and so we, you know, kind of where I started, and in a sense, maybe this is sort of where I'm leading to at, at an end here. Um, everything is contingent, you know, in, in ways that we don't necessarily anticipate until they're challenged. Um, rights are contingent. Rights um, can be bestowed or removed uh, in ways that require people to perk up and pay attention and voice dissent, um, mm -hmm. talk to their representatives, do things, act in ways that make it clear that whatever is happening is not happening without witnesses and without people who are willing to stand up uh, and, you know, voice what they feel they have a right to do and what normally should provoke, a, a, you know, a conversation, a debate, a, not a fight, not violence, not the sorts of things that I write about. Um, you know, uh, democracy is intended to be a framed process driven argument um, that ideally can diffuse and eliminate the need for violence. If you're trying to enforce your views through violence, you're kind of, what I wanna say is spitting at the democratic process because the democratic process really doesn't embody and encompass um, that kind of behavior. Well, we have about three or four minutes. So I'm gonna ask a really simple question. Uh-oh. Not at all. I, it's actually, I, it's, I it's a that. great Even question from James. Yeah. Okay. But this will be our final question, and then we'll have a quick announcement before we transition to the after party. Um, uh, James asks, as a historian, how do you sort through, quote unquote, real and, quote unquote, imagined rights when so many rights advocates tether them to Supreme Court cases, the Declaration or the Constitution for credibility? 
Well, right. That's not an easy question. No, I'll, it's not. But it's not at all. I, I will say in a broad sense, um, which is not quite going to answer this, but kind of will. As a historian, I'm more interested in understanding how people at the time understood rights than in determining them in some objective sense, right? So I, I guess I look at it when I look back to the founding era, um, I assume that there are subjective assumptions on the parts of the historical characters I'm looking at. And what I really wanna try and do as best I can is figure out what they are thinking um, and the implications of what they are thinking and then figure out what they assume about what other people are thinking and try to construct for my own understanding some idea of the, the intellectual landscape of what's going on at that moment and then explore how it played out and what the implications of it are. Um, and sometimes if you're lucky, the historical characters actually put in writing, like here is what I think, but that really doesn't happen a lot of the time. So then you end up reading between the lines of uh, what they say, looking at public documents, trying to figure out like in what ways do newspapers reflect the public conversation, um, digging around for patterns of language, for example. You know, I remember um, you writing my first book and looking at um, the election of 1800, for example, and noting how many times people used the words anarchy and civil war in describing that coming election. Well, okay, once I noticed the pattern and I literally, I have index cards, they're lurking back there somewhere. And one of them is civil war, all the times I saw it and anarchy and all the times I saw it, that tells you what people are thinking. You see enough of that? That's a pretty important statement about how people were experiencing that moment. So particularly when it comes to rights, and I'm not a legal historian, so um, I am not a, a historian who by definition is interested in, in trying to link law and, and history in that way. I'm interested in delving into a historical moment and understanding how it played out. Um, and then in a sense, I leave it to other kinds of scholars to take those kinds of understandings and talk about how they are shaping who we are today. My purpose here on Friday mornings is to say, if you think about historically what things were, how they happened, what they mean, you should bear that in mind. We should bear that in mind in understanding how things are unfolding right now so that we don't take things for granted right now, so that we ask questions, so that we're aware of processes, that, so that we can see possibilities, positive and negative, and negative, potential positive and negative, so that we can really understand the contingency of this moment, which becomes fully apparent when, only when, you understand the full historical context. Look at that, one minute over. Yeah, well, hey. well technically we didn't start till 10.03, so we're right on schedule. And, this and, is but, but um, so there we have, before we go, so actually, so two things here. So um, what will happen next, and I will make the speech I always make, but before I do that, um, we will go to the after party. I will explain what that is in a moment for newcomers who are here. But before we do that, um, maybe Matt, um, yeah. I will I will let you make an announcement. Yeah, so we have a, a announcement. This is uh, somewhat sad news, or some of you might find this to be incredibly good news. I'm not it sure. Is, it is but <laughs> But- uh, Her rumpf. Her rumpf. Um, but for those of you who uh, out there, we want to announce today that um, I am actually no longer with NCHE. Um, I am my own entity and uh, pursuing new on. opportunities and going a on free agent as they were, as, as they going say. Going on to great opportunities to pursue his great ability as an <laughs> educator. As an, I'm, I'm very excited. This is, there'll be uh, some great things coming up for me, but um, I did want it. So we are, uh, we've talked and we're going to, uh, I'm going to finish out the live episodes of 2021, which will take us to the next two weeks uh, as your moderator and partner in crime. Um, but I, uh, I just wanted to just say uh, that, let everybody know that that's going to be happening. So if I, when I'm two gone. More, two more times that my partner in crime shall be here with me. Yes. Um, but so I, I didn't want it to be shocking at all, but I, so I, I will not be here at the beginning of, the, of next year, um, but uh, thank you everybody for everything. This has just been a delight to be a part of this, and Joanne, you are um, a godsend to me and to uh, history, people who think about history, and, and I, I'm, I'm really grateful for this opportunity, so thanks everybody, and um, I Don't will- Don't go away, because- I, we're, we're not going away yet, but I, I will be, uh, Two more weeks and then uh, I am 
officially done with all of my duties related to NCH. And I and I do want to also have a moment to applaud the fact that Matt is going on to bigger and better things because um, you deserve all of them, Matt. But I, I see that Christy and, and Grace you. would like to beam in at this moment too. We are beaming in and we just also <laughs> wanted to th say thank you on behalf of NCHE and everything. Your um, your work on the show and community particularly has been very important. Your work modernizing History Matters and all the programming you've worked on. So NCHE thanks you very much, Matt. And we know that your your community will miss you very much here. So we're, we're pleased that um, you can be here for the rest of the season. And, and we know that you have great things ahead of you in, in your history education career. We know you'll still be in the history education community and we're excited to see all your adventures. And Matt, as I um, <clears throat> as I was thinking about this morning, as I'm getting already a little beclumped, I got to think about that we in various capacities have worked together for the last 15 years. And then I went, oh my gosh, it's been 15 years. <laughs> um, and I am just so glad that this community has had the opportunity to get a glimpse at your generosity of intellect and creativity and energy. And I just am looking forward to all the wonderful contributions that you have made, are making, and will make in history education. And I'm just thrilled to be a friend and colleague. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, everybody. Thank you. So two more. We have two more, two more. Crime, crime sessions. Um, and, and now I will say what I always say, which is um, particularly if there are newcomers here, um, at this point, uh, every week, we are going to segue into the after party, uh, at which point we will no longer be recording the conversation so we could be freer and easier in what we're going to be talking about. Um, if you beamed in through the NCHE website, just stay right where you are. And I know you all is probably on the bingo card and poof, it will suddenly be the after party. If you are on Facebook and beaming in through Facebook, you will need to leave Facebook and join through the NCHE website link, which is NCHE teach.org slash conversations. So um, on that note, I will indeed say what I always say and that now happens to be in writing, which is thank you as always for joining us here, um, for engaging in democracy, the democratic process every Friday morning. Um, and as always, I have no idea what I'll be talking about next week and hopefully I will decide it. I always aim, I always aim for like, maybe I could do it by Wednesday, um, <laughs> but odds are it'll be Thursday, but I hope you will join us again at a time when it is very important to be thinking about democracy uh, and rights. Uh, and in the meantime, for those of you who are not going to stick around for the after party, I wish you all a wonderful week, a wonderful aware week, where we, we will continue to watch and see what's going on around us uh, and uh, see you guys soon. And for those who are sticking around, just watch the poof. The poof is about to happen, right? <laughs>